All right, it's good to be here with you. Uh, good morning from uh, Virginia. And uh, this is uh, going to be our, our last series here. And uh, I'm packing quite a bit into this message here today, uh, some of which uh, I will review uh, what I presented two messages ago, but very briefly, because we need to kind of grasp the the big picture of the heavenly sanctuary and then we'll talk about characteristics of uh, worship and music and so without any uh, further delay i will go ahead and share uh, my screen at this point and get started again you can visit my site biblical sanctuary productions and the title of our message today is The Heavenly Sanctuary and the Universal Characteristics of Worship and Music. Uh, and that is so very important that we grasp the universal nature of what is presented in the heavenly sanctuary because it will again have an application for each and every culture. Now, uh, a few sessions ago, I talked about the fact that the heavenly sanctuary is the center of worship. It was the center of worship before the creation of the earth. You'll find this in, in Jeremiah chapter 17, and verse 12. I'm briefly going to go there myself and just uh, mention this, Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 12, where it states, a glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. A few important things there. This glorious high throne has been there from the very beginning, intimating before the creation of the earth. And the word our indicates that the heavenly sanctuary belongs not only to the inhabitants of heaven, but it's also the center of everything we do here on earth. Now, I'm just simply going to refer you to some of the, uh, the, the messages that I bore, uh, not yesterday, but the previous message, in order to see how the sanctuary is even the center, the heavenly sanctuary is even the center throughout the Old Testament era. It's the center throughout the New Testament era and in heaven as well. The other important thing is that the sanctuary coordinates and integrates God with, with um, angelic beings, with human beings, and with the rituals that are performed therein. So God is very interconnected with the heavenly sanctuary. And here in the Old Testament, um, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, God is introduced as the great I am. In verse 15, he says, this is my name forever and my memorial unto all generations. So the I am is God's name. Uh, and in Exodus 25, verse 8 and 9, he says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, in verse uh, 5, notice what it says here, Deuteronomy chapter 12. I'm turning there in verse 5. The Lord says, But unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all his tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall you seek, and thither shalt thou come. In verse 11 of the same chapter, it says, Then there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. That's where you're going to bring all your offerings, and that's where you're going to assemble. And there's a warning in verse 13. It says, Take heed to yourself that you offer not your burnt offerings in every place which you see, but in the place which the Lord your God shall choose. Now notice in Exodus 24, uh, 5, verse uh, 8, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And then in Exodus 3, verse 15, we are told that the I am is God's name. And in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 11, he says that you're to assemble in the place where God causes his name to dwell. Okay? So... God dwells with his people in the sanctuary, and then God causes his name uh, to dwell. Those are two, ways, two different ways of saying the same thing, okay? And the other texts simply bear this out, and I'm not going to go through them. But I want to go through 
uh, how the I am is linked with worship and music. So if you're in Deuteronomy, then I'm going to go to 1 Chronicles chapter 15 and verse 16. So 1 Chronicles chapter 15 and verse 16. This is a very interesting part of Israelite history because in 1 Chronicles 13, if you'll remember, the Israelites followed the Philistines and placed the ark of God on a cart. They put it on a new cart and they began to play before God with all their might with singing and harps and psalteries and, and timbrels and cymbals. And you know what happened when the ark reached the uh, threshing floor there. Uzzah reached forth his hand to touch the ark and God struck him. Well, David had had some time in order to think and reflect and study his Bible. And uh, in First Chronicles chapter uh, 15, let's see. Okay, so in First Chronicles chapter 15, David uh, has been doing some Bible study. And he realizes that uh, they didn't go about doing things the right way. Um, and in, in verse uh, 15 of First Chronicles 15, it says, And the children of the Levites bear the ark of God upon their shoulder with staves thereon, as Moses commanded, according to the word of the Lord. And David spoke to the chief of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be the singers with instruments of music psalteries and harps, those are basically stringed instruments, cymbals sounding by lifting up the voice with joy. So three out of the four instruments are mentioned there, and you can find also cymbals mentioned in verse 19. But I want you to go to 1 Chronicles 16, because we're going to make the connection there with the presence of God and this worship arrangement. It says in verse 1, so they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tent that David had pitched for it, and they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. So notice, they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst, and then uh, it says they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. Well, in uh, verse 4, it says, and he appointed certain of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord and to record and to thank and to praise the Lord God of Israel. So you find the ark uh, is completely synonymous with the presence of God there. Now, as we continue to read in verse five, I'm going to I'm going to bypass all those difficult names uh, and we're going to get to the middle of verse five of chapter 16. And he talked about the Levites there with psalteries and harps, but Asaph made a sound with cymbals. Again, this is all being done before the Lord, uh, before the ark. And then finally, the last instrument, Benaiah also and Jehaziel, the priests, with trumpets continually before the ark of the covenant of God. So this was the worship arrangement. This was the choice that was made actually by God himself. I want you to turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 25. This is in Hezekiah's Reformation, and this is roughly about 300 years after King David. And as he followed uh, his father, who uh, basically went by the ways of the kings of Israel and desecrated the sanctuary, there was a massive Reformation. And then in verse 25 of 2 Chronicles 29, it states, and he, referring to Hezekiah, set the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals and with psalteries and with harps, according to the commandment of David and of Gad, the king's seer, and Nathan the prophet, for so was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. So this arrangement of psalteries and harps, which are stringed instruments, the symbol, which is struck to sound uh, uh, as they begin each, uh, each hymn or song, and, and trumpets, the, this restriction was based on the commandment of the Lord through his prophets. Now, as we continue on in the message, we'll discover the ritual uses of that and what it tells us about bi the biblical characteristics of worship and music. But if you're in Second Chronicles 29, go to Ezra, the very next book, and this is 300 years after Hezekiah, or 600 years after David, and when the children of Israel come out of Babylon, they, um, they come to rebuild the temple, 
And in verse 10 of Ezra chapter 3, it says, When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And you basically find the same thing in the book of Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 27, where, it's, where it states, Ezra, or I'm sorry, Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 27, and at the dedication of the wall, they sought out the Levites out of all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to keep the dedication with gladness, both with thanksgivings and with singing, with cymbals, psalteries, and with harps. Okay, in verse 36 of the same chapter, and they have the musical instruments of David, the man of God, and Ezra, the scribe, before, before them. All right, so you find here in, uh, in all throughout the Old Testament that this, the sanctuary was the center of, center of worship, and the worship arrangement that restricted the instruments to the four that were just mentioned was given by the commandment of the Lord. All right, so that's where we are so far. As we get to the New Testament, again, the heavenly sanctuary is the center of worship. It says, but you are come to the heavenly Jerusalem. In other words, God's people that are assembling from uh, every geographical location and throughout the centuries are ultimately coming to the heavenly Jerusalem. In the book of Revelation, chapter 4, you'll find that the throne is mentioned 19 times in the book of Revelation, chapters 4 and 5, a total of about 46 or 47 times throughout the entire book of Revelation. But there is just one central throne here. And you can see that everything revolves around this central throne. For instance, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 4, it says, And round about the throne were 24 seats, and upon the seats I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now, in verse 6, it says, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind, or four living creatures. So, so far, you have 24 elders that are around the throne. You have four living creatures that are around the throne. Now, let's go to chapter 5 and verse 6. It states, And beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. So you have the lamb that is also in the midst of the throne. And in verse 11 of chapter 5, it says, And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. So everything here is revolving around the one central throne. And this has real, real serious implications. You see, because worship practices, including the music, because there was music that was performed there, are not grounded in individual earthly cultures, but in heaven's culture, which includes the combined worshipers of heaven and earth. Uh, this is incredibly important uh, because everywhere today we are being told that um, our worship practices specifically our music practices, are grounded in every earthly culture. Basically, what they're saying is that the way we conduct music um, is cultural. Uh, the, the notes that we use, the, the melodies that we use, the harmonies, the rhythms, all those things are inconsequential to having a good biblical worship experience. And so by grounding it in every, in, in every earthly culture, uh, we can see that that is opposed to this great heavenly scene that is taking place here in which you have the combined cultures of heaven and earth. You also find this in chapter 7, verses 9 to 13. It talks about this great multitude in verse, in verse 9. In chapter 10, they are ascribing salvation to God who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb. In verse 11, you have all the angels stood around about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts, and they fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped. 
saying amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. So you have there again, the great multitude with all the angelic hosts and all the worshipers of heaven. So there's only one worship service that includes the combined inhabitants of heaven and earth. There are not contradictory worship services for different cultures. That's what this incredible scene uh, tells us. So since this is taking place in the heavenly sanctuary, what is the purpose and function of the heavenly sanctuary? So what is the purpose and function of it? So as the ultimate place where worshipers around the universe gather, it functions as the authoritative prototype and model of what worship looks like. And this, uh, this is better portrayed in Revelation chapters four and five. The heavenly sanctuary gives us the window into heavenly realities by interconnecting them and then interpreting them, which includes the nature of music. The heavenly sanctuary unites heaven and earth together. Thus, what is revealed there has universal implications. What about the work of the Holy Spirit? The work of the Holy Spirit is to reveal the nature of the heavenly scenes that we on earth should seek to emulate in our worship. I read chapter 5, verse 6, but I just stopped short of the implications for the work of the Holy Spirit. So let's read it again. Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, it says, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Now, the question here is, what is the Holy Spirit sent forth into all the earth to communicate? Well, there are obviously amazing things that are taking place in that heavenly sanctuary that describe what is happening in the plan of salvation, that describe what the role of Jesus is as our heavenly high priest, and which also describe the characteristics of worship and what is central in worship and the nature of All right, I think I'm back now. Apologies for the lack of uh, connection there. Uh, let's head back. So I was talking about this cooperation that takes place between uh, the work of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary and the Holy Spirit. And you can look in, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. It says, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. That, of course, is talking about Jesus. You can find that in Revelation chapter 1 uh, and verse uh, 13 to the end of that chapter. And so Jesus then preaches a message, and it begins in verse 2, and I'm not going to read that because that's not pertinent. Uh, he says, I know your works and your labor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. When he is finished with that message, he says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. So notice, Jesus originates the message, which is grounded in his work in the heavenly sanctuary, and then when he uh, delivers that message to the angel of the church there, the elder perhaps of the church, when the elder speaks that message, the appeal is to listen not to what Jesus is saying, but to what the Holy Spirit is saying, not just to the church, but to the churches. That's very important. So the heavenly sanctuary and the Holy Spirit, what is taking place there grounds the messages to the churches that are located not just in Asia Minor, but those seven churches were picked, by the way, there were not just seven churches uh, back then, but those were typical of the, of, of the churches which would uh, have characteristics that would involve all of God's people to the end of time. And so uh, when it says to listen to what the Spirit says to the churches, this is a universal message that applies to all the churches. So when we go back to Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, whatever is revealed there, uh, the Holy Spirit is sent forth in order to communicate that to everyone. Now, the sanctuary is a model. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5, this is what it states. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5, it states, 
that uh, the priests who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed you in the mount. That word pattern is the Greek. can also be translated as a model. You see, no one has been to heaven. Uh, only the prophets that were shown these things are able to relate them to us. But what was revealed in heaven is so much more glorious, and there are so much, there's so much more data involved there that God had to reduce it to a model, which then represented those heavenly realities. So models are scaled-down versions of the reality that they represent. So when John was there in Revelation chapter 4 and 5, he saw and heard the real thing. Those were actual scenes that he was witnessing. A door opening in heaven, uh, a throne, 24 elders, four living creatures, the, the, the worship and the music. Those were actual real things that John saw and heard up there. Yet in his description, he was, dis he was restricted to using language that corresponds to what we know so that we in turn could get a glimpse into what we have never seen or heard, okay? So uh, when we compare two things, this, uh, and I'll talk about this as I talk about a model. When we compare two things, they are either completely identical, completely dissimilar, or there are some things that are similar and others that are not. For instance, if you are watching the screen right now, no matter where I've gone in my presentations here in the West, um, when I ask people, what is this car? Now, it's close enough for you to see the title on the hood. Uh, and so you can say, well, yeah, it's a Chevrolet. But uh, I can even ask a more specific question. And that is, uh, what, what, what kind of car is this? Well. And without fail, there are always people in the audience that say, that's a 1957 Chevy. Um, my daughter got that for me when she was in Cuba. Uh, and uh, they are quite adept at keeping those old cars alive. And so um, now, so th there you are seeing the model right there. Uh, and uh, uh, for, let's say you were a missionary in some part of the world that had never ever seen a car before. And um, they asked you, you know, how long does it take to travel in an hour? And you say, well, you know, uh, 60 miles or maybe a hundred kilometers. And they scratch their heads thinking, how on earth can you do that? Uh, there's no way we could ever run that fast. Well, then you begin to describe to them this thing called a car. And the more you begin to talk, the more confused they are because those are just words you're saying. They have no conception of what you're actually trying to get across. But if you show them a model, like the one that you're seeing up on the screen here right now, if you show them this model, then they have a conception of what you're talking about. And you tell them that, look, this, it's just like this, but it's a lot bigger. And it actually has a lot more things to it, but you can reduce it to this then they can kind of say, well, they have a little better idea, at least of what you're talking about. Now, if you were to transport them to some place where they have cars and they get, out of the, they get out of the airplane, an even more sophisticated piece of technology, but once they get out of the airplane and they look outside and they see these things traveling on the road, they'll immediately be able to say, that's a car. They're not gonna say that that's a horse they're not going to say that that is a train or any other object. They, they will definitely be able to say that's a car on the basis of the model, even though they've never seen the model before. Now, when you compare a model car to a real car, obviously you can see the similarities. They're right there up on the screen. But there are vast differences as well. Uh, not all Real cars are not made out of wood. Real cars have an engine. This one doesn't. Uh, real cars have an electrical system. This one doesn't. Real cars have a braking system. This one doesn't. And I could go on and on and on. But just because there are things in the real car that are not in the model doesn't mean that the model is not a car. All right. So this is very important when we talk about 
what has been revealed to us in the heavenly sanctuary in the writings of the prophets, specifically in the book, books of Daniel and Revelation, which I have just read here in Revelation chapter 4 and uh, verse 5. So what is the purpose of the heavenly, uh, function of the heavenly sanctuary? Well, just like there's a relationship between earthly structures and the heavenly, so there's a relationship between the earthly harp and the heavenly harp. Now, we didn't read this, but in Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, it says, and when he, that's Jesus, the lamb, had taken the book, the four beasts and the uh, the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps. So when John looked at the instrument that they were playing, the closest he could come to describing it was a harp, okay? So he said that it was a harp, and then they sung a new song, and lo and behold, John could hear the words. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So when he described the instrument, he said, this is a harp now. If we were transported to heaven and, uh, and we looked around, we would be able to identify the throne of God on the basis of the model which was given to us. Even though we'd never seen it before, we would be able to identify the altar of incense. You find this in Revelation chapter 8, verse 3. On the basis of what has been revealed to us, we'd be able to, uh, we'd be able to say, oh, the, there's, the, the, there's the candlestick. And on the same principle, we would be able to say, aha, what's that? Oh, that's a harp. Why? Because it looks like the one that we have here. All right. So there is an integral relationship. Now, so when we talk about music, uh, what is music and how does it relate to worship? Remember, music is made up of tone. We discussed, we did, we discussed this yesterday. So for the purpose of time, I'm going to move on. Uh, and, and there's musical patterns like melody, harmony, rhythm, tempo, compositional structure. And this is what we're going to talk about a little bit more later, mathematics. This was a great discovery by Pythagoras in the 6th century BC that was confirmed in the 18th century through what's called the Overtone series. Now, again, just to underscore what I'm trying to say, the symbols that are there in the sanctuary point to spiritual realities. We cannot change the symbols. If we change the symbols, we're going to change not the realities, but our conception of the realities. In this case, it will change our conception regarding the nature of heavenly music. Okay, so you have an altar and you have animals that were sacrificed therein. You can't change those symbols without changing the reality. In other words, you can't put a you can't put an orangutan on the altar. It, first of all, it's not going to go down quietly when you try to slit its throat. Okay, so there's a reason for why the, the, the lamb was chosen, because in, it, in those characteristics, it would portray something about Jesus and his willingness to lay down his life for us. There is water in the labor, but you can't put some other liquid in there like motor oil or something. And then you have the Shekinah, God's presence. God was literally there. His real presence was there. And then you have choirs accompanied by strings. That was all throughout the Old Testament. And then in Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, the only accompanying instrument is the, um, uh, is the harp or a stringed instrument. And we need to explore the implications of that. Just a little bit of, uh, of, of, of uh, uh, describing the instruments that we already talked about in the Old Testament. Uh, so if you remember, there were four. There was trumpets. There was cymbals, and then there was lyres and harps, which are stringed instruments. Now, again, I'm kind of packing a lot into this, but because it's recorded, you can go over and prove all things and hold fast to that, which is good, which is what I would encourage you to do. The trumpet is a sounding instrument. It was not only used to communicate war, but it was also used to, to sound and get the attention of the people to come for corporate worship. In 1 Chronicles 15, 19, the symbol is also a sounding instrument. The practical function of the symbol was to call for the attention of the congregation to the performance of sacred song. This is borne out by the use of hismia, the verb, to describe their function and significance. Musically speaking, one could translate this by the verb sound. 
Hence, the head of the guild, 1 Chronicles 16, of the three heads of the guilds are said to sound the cymbal, 1 Chronicles 15, 19. Since both the trumpets and the cymbals were played together to announce the beginning of the song, uh, the players of both are called the sounders in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 42. Jones therefore proposes that the second half of 1 Chronicles 16, 5 should be translated uh, in such a way. Asaph was calling for attention with the symbols. You can find this in John Kleining's work, The Lord's Song, Lillian DeCon's uh, work, Notes on Music, and Alfred Sendry's work, Music in Ancient Israel. All of the sources that I've checked, uh, when it comes to the use of the symbol in the Old Testament liturgy or worship, none of them, none of them state that the symbol was used in, in the same way that a modern drummer would use the symbol, which is to pound out the, the rhythms of the song. Uh, again, I'm anticipating myself. They were not used to beat out the rhythm of the song, such as how modern drummers play the cymbals. This is based on the deduction that their size was much too small for them to be heard as resonating cymbals, according to Dr. Dukan in her book, Notes on Music, page 110. They were worn on the fingers like castanets and were clashed together by finger action. Again, according to Dr. Dukan. Uh, only the chief music leaders were to sound the cymbals, pointing to their function as sounders. Uh, the cymbals were not sounded during the singing, again, according to Dr. Dukan. She asserts that the Hebrew word tzeltzalim that was used to describe the symbol in earlier texts, like 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 5, and which was associated with pagan Canaanite cults, was no longer used for the Hebrew liturgy. Instead, the chronicle... Uh, the chronicler used the word metziltaim. She states, probably to avoid any connotation with pagan practices. If this is the case, then the change of name for the symbol in the Hebrew temple liturgy indicates a change in its use and function from pagan practices. These points regarding the use of the symbol effectively eliminate a, a persistent rhythmic syncopated emphasis such as we talked about yesterday, if you're unclear about what that is, then you'll have to listen to the yesterday's presentation. So uh, the symbol was not used in a rhythmic, in the rhythmic fashion in which many symbols are used today. Since trumpets and symbols are sounding instruments, they are disqualified from pointing to a biblical philosophy of music. They don't actually perform a musical, a real musical function. So that leaves us with the stringed instruments, the kinor, which is a harp, and the nevel, a 12-stringed instrument that was plucked with bare fingers and was possibly a zither, a lyre, or a harp. Now, let's talk about the implications of this. The following items point to the stringed instruments and, and, and harp as accompanying instruments. So in other words, the, the Levites would sing, and then the stringed instruments would be used to accompany them. So these are the following points that, uh, that lead me to this conclusion. The use of a plectrum in order to pluck the strings. And you could, of course, pluck one, one string at a more than one string at a time. The cymbals and trumpets are sounding instruments, while the kenor and neville are instruments of God's song, according to 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 42. So sounding instruments versus instruments of God's song, where the words are sung and which is accompanied by those instruments. So uh, what about the role of music in the sanctuary? We read 2 Chronicles 29 verse 25 and realized that the choice of cymbals, psalteries, and harps, and trumpets was a divine uh, arrangement that was based on the authority of the commandment of God. Now, the role of music in 2 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 27, is to call attention to the sacrifices without dominating them. So verse 27 of 2 Chronicles 29, it says, And Hezekiah commanded to offer the burnt offering upon the altar. And when the burnt offering began, that is so very important. When the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord began also with the trumpets and with instruments ordained by David, king of Israel. And then 
all the congregation worshiped and the singers sang. So notice, very important, what takes, what takes center stage? It's the altar of burnt offering and the sacrifice that is made there because that would be a form of, 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 of communication. It would be communicating that Jesus would come and be the ultimate sacrifice. God's word was being communicated through the ritual service. I don't have time to get into all that. We actually covered it in a previous presentation, and so I would encourage you to listen to that. But again, it's not the music that takes front and center stage here. It is the message conveyed through the altar of burnt offering. Furthermore, the most important role of the music is to proclaim and remember God's name. You find this in 1 Chronicles 16, verse 4, to proclaim all of his actions in 1 Chronicles 16, verses 15 to 19. And this message embraced the entire, uh, the entire earth. So when the Old Testament Hebrews made converts, um, they weren't encouraged to have, the converts weren't encouraged to have their own sanctuaries and their own nations. No, they were all encouraged to come to the central location where God, where God said he would place his name there. He would reveal himself there, and the liturgy or the worship service would be connected to the location of God's presence. So the, importance of, the important role of the music is to proclaim God's name. Music's subordinate function to the sanctuary, uh, uh, I'm sorry, music's subordinate function to the sacrifice was communicated spatially. So if you're in 2 Chronicles 29, go to 2 Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 12. 2 Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 12, it says, also the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph, of Heman, of Jedithan, and their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them 120 priests sounding with trumpets. So they were not at the altar. The altar was front and center. They were located at the east end of the altar and also before the altar. So their subordinate function uh, to the sacrifice is communicated spatially. The most important part is to communicate the name of God with words that must be uh, clearly heard. If you'll remember from yesterday's presentation, at that, at that worship service at the golden calf, no words were heard. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 5. Remember, John is being shown this scene in a vision, and when he sees this scene, We'll pick it up in verse 8. It says, when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Now notice in verse 9, it says, and they sung a new song saying, thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. And I'm not going to repeat the rest of what's there. You can find the words in verses 9 to verse 12 and 13. In other words, in heavenly music, you can clearly hear the words that are being sung because John hears them, and he knows that also the singing is being accompanied by harps. Music in Revelation chapter 5 draws attention to the Lamb and to his achievements. It doesn't take front and center stage. Music primarily communicates emotions, okay? This is a very important point. Because in other systems, music communicates the presence of God, actually. In uh, Roman Catholic worship, the presence of God is contained in the, in the wafer or in the bread and in the wine. And in the charismatic movement, they've simply changed the mode of God's presence from the bread and the wine to the music. So the same presence of God that it's allegedly in the bread and the wine is now allegedly in the music itself, like I'm talking about in the physics of the sound. We're not talking about the words at all. We're talking about just the sound. And so in all other systems, music actually communicates the divine presence because they have a, a, an unbiblical view of the relationship between God and the world. Uh, but... So if music doesn't communicate the divine presence, uh, what does it communicate? Uh, well, it speaks of emotions. And its purpose in the sanctuary was to communicate joy. 
So the emotions and the words should be matched by the music. And so just as I read the words, um, what emotions come to your mind here? Now, remember, John was weeping previous to this. Uh, he was absolutely depressed because no one was found worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. And so, uh, and then finally he sees the lamb. So first of all, he's depressed. Now notice what the angelic host is singing and try to see if you can capture the emotion. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof for thou was slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever. Friends, do you hear the note of triumph in those words? Do, uh, do, do you see that the emotions have switched from depression to joy and gladness? The music is designed to match that. It communicates the emotions and not the divine presence. So now let's talk about the choice of strings. We, uh, we've already made the case that a model uh, indicates what the heavenly reality is like. So if a string instrument is chosen, like the harp, what does it actually communicate about the nature of the sounds that John is hearing? Well, the overtone series was first described at the beginning of the 18th century. Now, I, need to, I need to say this, it's going to get a little technical from a musical standpoint here. And uh, I want you to go to a certain uh, uh, presentation that you'll find on YouTube, just punch up the overtone series by Leonard Bernstein. Uh, it will give you an example, an actual aud auditory example of the things that I'm pointing out. And so I'll try to mention that again. So the Overtone series first uh, described at the beginning of the 18th century, it gives much new insight into the Pythagorean principles of consonance and dissonance. Consonance means sounds that are agreeable, dissonance, uh, disagreeable sounds, tense sounds. And it greatly extends our capacities for acoustical analysis. It has been described as a kind of periodic table, but of musical tones instead of chemical elements. Hence, like the periodic tab uh, table of chemical elements, the overtone series is a part of creation's order given, enduring, and constant. That comes from Albert Blackwell's book, The Sacred in Music, pages 55 and 56. Um, he's, not only, uh, he's not only a musician, uh, but he's also a physicist uh, who had done work at MIT. So he's very well aware of things musically, but also he is a physicist as well. Now, there are two types of overtones. Um, every sound that, uh, every single sound, no matter what it is, even if I clap my hands, or if I, if I sing, or if I strike something uh, on the drum or a, a, or, or a string uh, or anything like that, every single sound produces what are called over tones. So that there are more tones that are actually uh, there in what most people hear. And so there are only two kinds of overtones. There are periodic or harmonic overtones that occur in a series like you can graph like in a sine wave. And there are non-harmonic overtones that are, that are very complex. Let's start with the non-harmonic overtones. These are produced by cymbals, bells, and other percussive instruments. These overtones are non-regular, non-harmonic, and often extremely complex. Like if you're trying to graph them, it would be very complex to graph them. Cultures that primarily employ these as accompanying instruments produce melodic music 
according to Blackwell, consisting of transient tones that sound successively, as is the case with many folk musics of the world. In other words, they're playing one tone at a time. Uh, this is not a harmonic tradition is what Blackwell is trying to say. So when those are the primary instruments of a musical culture, you have tones sounding successively. Now let's switch to what's called periodic or harmonic overtones as produced by strings, keyboards, brass, woodwind instruments of a symphonic orchestra. Now remember, in Revelation chapter 5 verse 8, John looks at that instrument in heaven and says, aha, it's a harp. So a harp is a stringed instrument. Now what Pythagoras discovered many centuries ago is that there's a... Uh, and what 18th century um, uh, scientists have further amplified was that there is, um, uh, there is a direct relationship here between the size of the string and how often it, and, and how it vibrates. And you can check this out on the piano as well. If you play a low C and then the next C above it, the, the high C vibrates twice as fast as the low C, okay? And, um, and this can actually be demonstrated, which is why I'd, I'd encourage you to listen to Bernstein's uh, explanation of this. This is an actual phenomenon of physics, okay? So when the, when, the, when the string is chosen, the most consonant sound is an octave. And then next you move to a perfect fifth, which if, if you're in the key of C, the next note will be G, but an octave above the next C. And the correct, the, the mathematical relationship is two to three. That's how the vibrations go. Then the perfect fourth, three to four. Then the major third, four to five. The minor third, the major whole tone, et cetera, et cetera. The, the closer you are to the fundamental octave that is played, the more agreeable the sounds are. The further you get away from that fundamental octave, the more dissonant the sounds are in relation to that fundamental note, which, which we'll call the C at this point. So at this point, the most agreeable sounds are the octave, the perfect fifth, and the major third. Now, according to Bernstein, the, uh, the entire history of Western music is built on the major chord, which you find here, C, E, and G. This was dictated not by European culture. This was dictated by the phenomenon of physics and the choice of the string, okay? This is a phenomenon of physics. Let's continue on. Cultures that use, uh, that use instruments that produce periodic vibrations such as strings tend to produce music that is predominantly harmonic consisting in sustained tones that sound simultaneously in chords, as is the case with most music deriving from uh, the post-medieval European culture. Thus, the choice of strings produce melodic music that is grounded in harmony. Now, now, listen to what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that everything that comes from Europe is stamped with the cross and everything is okay. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that they, they actually captured it, okay? Not that everything that comes out of there is okay. Uh, and it is true that the Western musical tradition is a harmonic tradition that, that comes on the basis of the discovery of the overtone series. So in other words, uh, you know, uh, our modern music, our, our Western, I, I should say, musical system here is made up of 12 tones. Well, these guys didn't just toss a coin and say, well, okay, which one should be used in our musical system? That's not how it happened. Uh, because the, the choice of those instruments through physics actually dictated which sounds were consonant and which were dissonant, okay? As we move on, here are some other characteristics of the heavenly, of the heavenly sanctuary. Okay, so you have leaders there. You have the four living creatures and the 24 elders. They often take the lead. But then, you, then the music becomes congregational and universal so that it's not a performance. 
When we come together on Sabbath, it should not just be a performance. That doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with 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 uh, with playing a special music because that's indeed what the what the four living creatures do in Revelation four and 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 they begin in Revelation five and then the entire congregation picks up the refrain. So this is not a performance in which you're just watching people over and over and over again for thirty or forty minutes. Also, the words carry the strong melodic line that is easily heard by John when I read those in, in chapter five verses nine to nine to twelve. Harmony is revealed by the choice of the harp. Harmony is also suggested by the fact that John heard the voice, that's in the singular, of many angels round about the throne saying with a loud voice. So, um, so this to me combines the suggestion of the strings to sing in harmony, but they sing as one voice here, okay? And that's what harmony is. Uh, it, it, it is a unity. It doesn't necessarily mean that all are singing the same note. That's suggested by the choice of the strings. The, the music plays a supportive role in accompanying the word sung. The characteristics of the music are melody grounded in harmony. This observation is not derived from any particular human culture, but from the harmonic overtones that come from strings. Thus, the ground for the kind of music that I'm describing as melody grounded in harmony is based on, is universal, and it's based on physics, okay, by the choice of the string. That's what's being communicated. Just like in a visual sense, I will know when I see the altar of incense. I will know when I see the throne. In an auditory sense, if the harp is included, if the harp is mentioned, well, then you know you have a kind of music that is suited to melody grounded in harmony, all right? And as, as I close, I just, want to, I just want to call your attention to some statements in the spirit of prophecy and how she describes the music that she heard. She says, music can be a great power for good, but we do not make the most of this branch of worship. The singing is generally done from impulse or to meet special cases. Uh, uh, cases. And at other times, those who sing are left to blunder along and the music loses its perfect effect, proper effect upon the minds of those present. Music should have, now notice this, this is actually an amazing statement. And if you gloss over it too quickly, you will not discern its philosophy. So it says, uh, music should have beauty, Okay, so it should be aesthetic beautifully. It should, it, it should have beautiful sound. It should have pathos. That means feeling and power. Now notice what she doesn't say, which all the rest of the many other musical philosophers in the Catholic Church do say. And that is, she doesn't say that the divine presence is somehow embedded in the music. That is an amazing statement. So music should have beauty, power, uh, pathos. That means feeling and power. This means that according to Ellen White, music communicates emotions and feelings. Now, um, our character is changed by our feelings. What controls the feelings can control the character. So music should have beauty, pathos, and power. Let the voices be lifted in songs of praise and devotion. Call to your aid a practicable instrumental music and let the glorious, notice what she says, harmony ascend to God an acceptable offering. This is from the voice and speech and song, all of these quotes. Great improvement can be made in singing. Some think that the louder they sing, the more music they make, but noise is not music. Good singing is like the music of the birds, notice subdued and melodious full of melody. That's telling you that melody takes precedence over the kinds of rhythms that we talked about yesterday. Moving on, I have been shown the order, the perfect order of heaven, and have been enraptured as I listen to the perfect music there. After coming out of vision, uh, the singing here has sounded, uh, the singing here has sounded very harsh and discordant. I have seen companies of angels who stood in a hollow square, everyone having, notice, a harp of gold. At the end of the harp was an instrument to tune the harp or to change the tunes. Their fingers did not sweep over the strings carelessly. Obviously, this is harmony is being described as she talks about sweeping over the strings. But they touched, notice, different strings to produce different sounds. She's actually describing harmony there. 
There is one angel who always leads, who, who first touches the harp and strikes the note. Then all join in the rich, perfect music of heaven. It cannot be described. It is melody, heavenly, divine, while from every countenance beams the image of Jesus shining with glory unspeakable. It's very clear that she was describing melody grounded in harmony. This statement here, let those men and women who are satisfied with their dwarfed, crippled condition and divine things be suddenly transported to heaven and for an instant witness the high, the holy state of perfection that ever abides there, every soul filled with love, every countenance beaming with joy, enchanting music in, notice this, melodious strains, okay? So you have one melodic line that is being played, and it is also being accompanied by another melodic line different from that melodic line, and yet perhaps a third. That is talking about, obviously, melody, but then harmony as well. Okay. Uh, this is describing the, the experience of Lucifer before he fell. The influence of the holy angels seemed for a time to carry him with them as songs of praise ascended in melodious strains swelled by thousands of glad voices the spirit of evil seemed vanquished unutterable love thrilled his entire being well if 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 music as powerful as that is able to change the current of the devil's thoughts to switch from focusing on himself and how he can deceive a third of the angels for the time being to unutterable love to god and to his fellow angels then um, the wrong kind of music can bring the wrong kind of spirit and the wrong kind and produce the wrong kind of character. Notice, then was the melody of he uh, heaven heard, uh, and mortal e uh, and the heavenly choirs swept back uh, to heaven as they closed their memorable anthem. Now. I can describe my entire doctoral dissertation in this one uh, in this one statement. What took me over 600 pages to produce, this was found in one statement. Music forms a part of God's worship in the courts above. And this is what we've been finding in Revelation 4 and 5. And we should endeavor in our songs of praise, uh, of praise to approach as nearly as possible to the harmony of the heavenly choirs. Okay, because choirs sing and they sing in harmony. The proper training of the voice is an important feature in education and should not be neglected. Now, I'm going to go ahead and stop here at this point. Uh, so, uh, you'll find on the screen the musical characteristics that our church has point, had, had, uh, had referred to in times past. Um, and so, uh, I can, uh, I can pass that along to Brother Ronald and the rest of the crew there for you guys to look at later. Uh, and so uh, when we look at the heavenly sanctuary, we can see that it talks about melody grounded in harmony. The sanctuary is a model. It points to realities that are beyond the, the literal earthly sanctuary to heavenly realities in heaven. And when we take the Bible as it reads, and when we explore the implications, we find that our music should be, uh, the, the words should clearly be heard, like John heard them. There should be melody, there should be harmony. The music should not take the place of the message that is being sung. And the role of the Holy Spirit is to call our attention to what is taking place there and for us to emulate that in our worship and in our music today. So I pray that the Holy Spirit will give you courage. I pray that he'll give you strength as you grapple with these things and seek to make them a part of your worship experience. I wish you the Lord's richest blessings as you do that.